It's a fairy tale written by Charles Perrault in uh, 1650 or something like that. Uh, Charles Perrault wrote Cinderella, Bluebeard, Sleeping Beauty, a lot of fairy tales. I chose Podan, Donkey Skin, because it's a unique tale. Uh, what I mean is that if an adult reads it or a child, uh, they don't read the same story. There is one side who is very pure, very uh, childish almost, and another one who is almost perverse. It's very uh, interesting. And nowadays, I mean, we don't have many films who are for everyone, let's say. And <clears throat> the Pied Piper takes place in Germany during the Black Death, 1350, something like that. Uh, it was a very dark age, I mean, very uh, tough period. A lot of wars, a lot of problems, and a uh, lot of similarities as well, I mean, with uh, our days. I made a treatment that is very much like a ballad, a medieval ballad. And for example, uh, in the cinema today, we have very quick cut. Uh, who correspond to, uh, which correspond to, to, to our modern life, which, you know, jumping around and leaping and whatever. Uh, Middle Ages was, for me, I mean, like a ballad, a very long feeling of life, of days and passing by. And the camera uh, is looking around, like, I mean, the same, same pace and same uh, rhythm. Frankly, the Pied Pipers never struck me as a story excessively thick with subplots or subtleties. Wasn't it about this piper who promised to rid the plague-ridden Hamlin of its rats, did so, was cheated of his fee, and led off the town's children to teach the townsmen a lesson? Well, Jacques Demy and his merry screenwriters, whose pages seem to jostle and contradict each other more than the ugly sisters, have had all sorts of bright ideas about how to give the story shape, bulk, political significance, production values, and a bad case of elephantiasis. It drags its mammoth limbs like an attacker who's had the heart kicked out of him by the Leeds United Defence. A subplot concerning a wise Jew, inevitably condemned to the stake for preaching the virtues of scientific method and rational procedure. He should have known better than that seems to take most of the movie out of the hands or the mouth of Donovan, who plays the piper. Not a bad thing in principle, because Donovan's music is uh, better than his acting, as a sort of medieval simple Simon, but as relevant to the basic story, the rats, remember, as a short history of Western philosophy. Vast numbers of clerics, strolling players, and helmeted Germans of the nastier, taciturn sort parade through the movie, and a cathedral almost gets built before the good Jew is reduced to ashes, the plague comes to town, and we, and the children, are able to get away. Alas, to my mind, nothing like soon enough. Bagermeister, this is no place for a mere physician. This child is dying. Her deathbed is a sacred shrine. The child is not dying. Lord be praised. Nonsense. Blasphemy. Sacrilege. This is not the plague, but only a common fever. Possibly a case of tarantism. She needs calm and rest. Perhaps music would help. <laughs> music? Music is an ancient remedy in these cases. A well-known cure. Bagermeister. Superstitious philanderings have been denounced by Pope Clement himself and by our Holy Mother, the Church, on pain of excommunication. Shh. I am not of your faith, Your Grace. Who is this man? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Melius, His Grace the... Uh... Melius? Melius? To take medicine from a Jew, my lord, is to enter into a contract with Lucifer. By all the saints. Your Grace. Shh! Listen! Where is she, Bergamot? What's going on here? What are you all doing? Look! Look, her eyes are open.
him, he's probably better advised to stick to his own highly personal style. Pied Piper was a collaboration with outside producers and writers. At least Magic Donkey, which you saw earlier, came from Demi's own elaborate imagination and not from the soggy compromises of script conferences. The difference between making your own films and commercial films, whose makers approach a product for children with a heavy sigh and often a heavy hand, is demonstrated by a short film lovingly made by Richard Lowe at the newly formed animation department at the London Film School. Lowe designed the costumes and painted the expressions on the actors in this Japanese fable, Spirit of the Bird. Other work by the London Film School can be seen at the National Film Theatre on December the 6th. And now for Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Well, no film could be more deliberately tailored for an audience. Trying its damnedest to please, it's full of brilliant special effects. The shrinking and growing in particular are marvellously done. Unfortunately, producers have the idea that if you take a great book and make a film of it, you're bound to have a great film. You might as well believe that if you put it in a pot and boil it, you're bound to have a great meal. However, if pretty costumes, funny voices, and elaborate examples of the set designer's skill are enough to bring mum, dad, and the kids back to the movies in their wholesome hordes, Mr. Joseph Shaftel's production should have a huge success. God knows it tries harder and harder. Here's one scene that does work well, where Alice meets the Duchess for the first time. Oh, there's certainly too much pepper in that soup. Please, would you tell me why your cat grins from ear to ear like that? It's a chess cat, and that's why. Pig! Well, I didn't know that Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know that cats could grin. They all can, and most of them do. I don't know of any that do. You don't know much, and that's a fact. The world will around a good deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage. <laughs> Peter Bull taking his chance as the Duchess is one of the few guest stars whose personality is not suffocated by fur, mask, or excessive makeup. Not much is left of the magic of Alice either, still less of the wit. The script by the director, William Sterling, is as determined to improve the unimprovable as the Red Queen's gardeners are to paint her white roses red. There's as much contempt involved in excessive sweetness, I think, as there is in excessive violence or excessive sex, and perhaps as much damage done. 
the railway children and the amazing Mr. Blunden prove that it's perfectly possible to make a children's film that works within its own terms. On the other hand, judging from what I know of my own children, I don't believe that harmlessness appeals to them. It appeals more to certain people's idea of them. To remind us then of Lewis Carroll's Alice, let's end the programme with a short film made for us by Ian Stern and based on Tenniel's original drawings. He calls it Alice as she was. Sean Connery gave his million dollar fee for Diamonds Are Forever to the Scottish International Educational Trust. His deal also guaranteed backing for two films of his own choice. Tonight we look at the first. Stop! Look! He's gunning for trouble! Who are you? Bond. James Bond. James Bond. Mixing business with girls and thrills. The hotter the danger, the cooler he takes it. I think you've made your point, Goldfinger. Thank you for the demonstration. Double O seven. Who are you? My name is Pussy Galore. <laughs> You're worse than that if you don't tell me. I'm doing this under orders I know. And what are they? Her directions were easy to follow. And she sent a few of her friends to make sure I didn't get lost. Up to my neck in hot water. Or something blowing up in my face. I had the two-picture deal from United Artists on the strength of doing the film Diamonds Are Forever. I decided that I would like to have a company that would have not just combined talents for making the two pictures, but the possibility to develop into something that would uh, realize their own sort of potential. Yeah, it's totally original, I thought it's, it's not bad, is it? It's going to be put out black and white, Dennis? Mm. You know, it's very easy to reproduce something like that in black and in black and white, and, and as a yeah. sign symbol for the paper and the you know production uh, post production stuff. Yeah. Uh, all I want 
you know, us to, to agree is, is that the image is right and the layout's right. And then uh, we'll present it as, as the sort of thing we want to use on the picture. Mm -hmm. Did Charlie see this? No, tomorrow. He's away, unfortunately, this week. Well, this he week. He comes back this afternoon. Yeah, so I, I thought I'd run it into him tomorrow after Stanley and Richard had a, Dennis, a look. I'd like to see the lady's head on somewhere. Well, this is a game, you see. There are things missing off mm -hmm. it. I quite like that. I, I think it will be Tantalon Presents, I think so. um, a, a United Artists release or whatever they want for their, their, their situation. But I think it's Tantalon, to be honest, too. Charlie Berman is uh, uh, assistant yeah. managing director of United Artists, and uh, he's also uh, manager of publicity. It is the, uh, actually the third title change. The first one was um, This Story of Yours, which was based on the uh, uh, play. Then it was a change to uh, something like the truth, and now we're going with the offence. It's much more impactful. Cantalon, this film company I set up, by getting a team of uh, filmmakers, for example, like Dennis, Dennis O'Dell, producer, Stanley Sopel, who was with Eon, who's an associate producer, and very, very good uh, financial man, has international uh, experience and Richard Hatton, who was my agent, and uh, well, with his experience, we will, they will eventually all co-produce. Well, it's a story, but once in a time there was a Scotsman, an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Jew. Um, I must get this right, the Scotsman was myself, there was the Englishman, which is Richard Hatton, the Irishman, which is Dennis O'Dell, and, and Stanley Sobel, who's Jewish. I enjoy working if it's a reciprocal arrangement between the, the crew, the workmen, the, the whole, the, the harmony makes for the, um, it comes on, I think it comes into the picture itself, and Stanley will vouch for that, I think that when we're doing the, the Bond films, that um, we had the same crew in many instances, for most of the pictures, the directors we changed three times, and three, five I did, or five, whatever it was, and six. How clever you are, Mr. Bond. Nice to see you haven't lost that fine mental edge, 007. Please don't get any foolish notions. That missile is not a practical weapon. Well, it's hardly worth the effort. After all, I wouldn't know which one of you to kill. We appreciate your predicament, Mr. Bond. We deeply sympathize. <laughs> Right idea, Mr. Bond. What's wrong, pussy? The last page of the Sean Connery hit was Diamonds Are Forever. We shot that picture in 16 weeks. It cost us $7 million, which is... Um, a lot of money, but not as expensive as some as the bonds, but the return has been enormous. Um, it was a good picture, and the proof of the pudding is there, that if you work quickly with the right sort of people, um, you do save money, and you lose no quality at all. Well, the picture, as Sean had said, was done under the terms of his agreement, you know, on the last uh, bond that he did, and they gave us a top limit of a million dollars um, to make the picture. Well, uh, of course, we ran into some problems on, you know, they had some revaluation of the dollar at that time, which hurt us considerably. But as it happened, it didn't matter because uh, even with the, the star arrangement that we have and the, the sort of the, 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 the great actors that we have in the movie, the picture still came in for $900,000, which these days is, is pittance time. <laughs> it really is. With a tremendous effort by the whole, you know, company and this studio, Twickenham here, uh, and all the, the talents that we got around us too, we came in on 28 shooting days. Uh, that, I mean, it's easy, you can do it in 23 shooting days, but uh, what's really important is the result. And in this case, um, I think it's the picture that was conceived by the company and the artists. And that goes from myself right along the line, Trevor and Ian and Vivian Merchant and all the other actors, and the writer, who was every day on the set. Uh, we had a two-week rehearsal period. We had a week's rehearsal when we worked together before on the hill, Sydney and I, and that was just enough because it was more of an ensemble piece. This uh, was um, 
many, many uh, flashes forward and backwards and uh, a lot of, sort of technicalities to iron out and had to get for continuous flow to know where we cut to and from. And uh, with a very intense first week with Trevor Howard, me, for the first two hours, uh, Vivian Merchant, me, for the second two hours, and Ian Bannon, me, for the third two hours. And by the third two hours, I was like, cockeyed. And we had the cameraman in, uh, Jerry Fisher, was in for rehearsals as well. And the set designer was on the, the stage here at Twickenham. And uh, consequently, all the pros got to work. Well, Sidney Lumet uh, started in the business as a child actor. Then, of course, he did a lot of uh, theatrical productions, and then he went to television, where I think he picked up this hard approach to film directing, um, which you've seen examples of in 12 Angry Men in the Hill and such great pictures. He's done Anderson tapes, you know, and things like that. Television and theater, yeah, yeah. both. They, but uh, primarily from the television thing of uh, blocking it, laying out your camera, making your dramatic selection in advance. I think the longest I've ever shot a picture was 48 days, and I was bored sick. And it was uh, brutal being on it that long. Normally, I, 30 to 40 days is uh, a good working tempo for me. I fought Sydney three times as a director for The Hill because I didn't think an American could handle the Englishness the Irishness, the Scottishness, the Welshness of the uh, of that army, you know. And uh, he proved me absolutely wrong. Well, sir. Oh, Para 528, Section 7. Uh, an officer will not reprove a warrant officer or an NCO in the presence or hearing of a private soldier. You know the KRR, don't you? Yes, sir. You're breaking every rule in the book. And you live by it, don't you? We're both regulars. We are the army. What the hell else are we supposed well, to do? I live by the book. Part of this and part of under section XY says that. But Queen Victoria's dead. It's out of date. I remember I always used to get accused of uh, photographing stage plays. Well, um, that's not so. There, I mean, there is more sheer film technique in uh, a picture like Long Day's Journey Into Night or uh, 12 Angry Men. There's more sheer movie technique in that than there is in 20 Westerns. Uh, that's easy. Uh, 5,000 horses is easy. A mountain is easy. Uh, to be able to use uh, a confined area uh, as one of the instruments in telling the story, and to use it, make it, make it have a dramatic contribution, uh, that really takes work. I'm running this place. You ain't running this place, Bert. William did. Look at him. He took over days ago. You still haven't caught on. I am reporting everything that happened here. It's you, Emma. But I won't worry too much of you go down with us. Um, the, with this subject, um, we didn't have any hesitation, any of us and the directors, uh, with a view about Sydney because, because of the experience in the Hill. Also, a very important fact, you could not start running over on this picture because it was done at such a pace and tempo um, that is the way that Sydney works and the way I like to work, where a, a certain tempo is pitched that and you keep it, and that's like you're looking like a motor pace. And if it starts to dissipate and run away, it would be a disaster. Kids out of school, business, 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 business. Place is empty. Jester drives up in the car. Oh, wasted time keeping him down. Yeah. Looks like we can go Christmas from Pancake Buddy Tuesday. Maybe it frightens him knowing we're here, watching. Oh, yeah, he's frightened. Bloody paralytic. Hold on to the car. How many kids is it he's had? Whoa! Wasted time keeping them out here. Those lads wouldn't know Christmas from Pancake Bloody Tuesday. Well, maybe it frightens him, knowing we're here, knowing we're watching. Oh, we've got him so frightened. Bloody paralytic. How many kids has he had? Three of them. Now, bloody smell. We've got the bugger so bloody frightened, he'll probably make it four before the week's out. Are you a cigarette machine? Yeah. Teddy was a better one than you. You were a great cigarette machine. I had a chat with Kenny James, did I tell you? Most of 
time talking to Kenny. He's not his line of country. Slash it a bit, maybe. Having them off, never in a million bloody years. Well, it doesn't hurt talking to you. You must be bloody desperate talking to him. I had a feeling if you heard anything. You wouldn't tell the coppers the time of day if he doesn't watch us. Drinks? On oh, no, Mr. Johnson. We'll pay. It's my shot, right? Sergeant? What is it? Uh, hey, Johnny, my love, I'm sorry. Here early. It's a wild. Uh, you'll take that. It's my turn, right? But the, your distance on location right. is much. Right. Take it. From a far field, I ask you to give you the right. But take the same engine fuel in that order. Time out. Um, on the house, Mr. Johnson. We'll pay. We'll, uh, we'll pay. We'll pay. It's my turn, right? It's a long time since I've seen Kenny. He's been away. Sergeant, it's not bloody long now. Nice lad, what is it? There's another kid missing. So bloody frightened. Okay, Peter, my love, out on the common. Oh, that's Let's that. read it, oh, my love. Uh, it comes right after I hope he takes note. Hmm? I hope he takes note, yeah. You want to charge him? No, I'd rather, you know, wait. Can't we? Can we? Have to charge him now or let him go? Do we want to let him go? No. Well, make up your bloody mind. When you talk to him... I'll talk to him when I'm good and ready. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah? I don't want to take a chance. Well, who knows we brought him in? Who have you talked to? No one. As long as no one knows, as long as we can hold him. <coughs> Has he talked to his solicitor? No. He knows he can't. He's been cautioned. We'll leave him to think another half hour. Oh, Johnny, that's marvelous. Perfect. That right? Yep. Yep. Cancel the order for, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Tell Harold we won't need him. I guess John and I, John Hopkins, who wrote it, uh, have worked closer on this than uh, most writers and directors, just in terms of meaning, in terms of intent. And the lovely thing that's happened is that it's... The whole thing is a surprise to both of us. If he doesn't cough, because she got very... Straight laced and straight over. Right right. If he doesn't cough and he's got any sort of solicitor, we'll have to let him go. Can't leave him sitting Well, I wrote it first for the play, and it was done at the Royal Court. Um, and uh, it was my first stage play, and specifically set out to get away from what I'd done on Z, uh, Z cars, you know, which was about the police. Um, it's easy to confuse the two because one is about the police and the other was the Z cars was about the police. They're not, of course, at all similar. One is a much broader statement, tries to be a broader statement than Z cars, which was specific adventure. This is not adventure. And then Sean uh, and Dennis O'Dell um, wanted to do it as a film. Um, it's taken them. It was a remarkable the amount of stamina. You know, the worst, the thing that is in shortest supply is stamina in people wanting to set up something. If they don't set it up immediately, that tragic thing happens that they lose interest or they lose momentum. No, it's not interest, it's momentum, and move on to something else. Sean and Dennis have remained locked onto this for two years, and here it is happening. You know. who's, it, who's in this film of yours? And I said, well, um, Sean Connery, Trevor Howard, Liam Bannon, Who's this? The Who's emergent, Jack Gold. He said, who's directing it? Sitting in there, he said, oh, well, we've all got our crosses, haven't we? <laughs> Jarvis. Jarvis. I hope that's very jealous, friend. I'm very jealous. I hope very, that's jealous. Jealous. I hope very, jealous. Jealous. I hope very, very jealous. No sugar, is it? That's it. Great. Thank you. He's very good. It's all right. Flattery will get him nowhere. No way. <laughs> he's rather... He's rather good. Mm. I love some clothes. Mm. Yeah. Dry good. White bit ugly, then. He's absolutely knocked out. You're actually shooting? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's that's the quietest place here. See how we live, eh? <laughs> if we get this here indoors with a restaurant right here, can you imagine, what it's, can you imagine right? what it's going to be on location? He loves the catering on the uh, fish and chips. Yes. It costs so much. We should be so lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thomas oh. Cook's doing it. First thing start. <laughs> Thomas Cook. <laughs> Sean, <laughs> who's the guy in Spain? A terrific Eduardo. Eduardo, oh, yeah. yeah. He's oh. the greatest. I mean, the greatest of all ever. It's worth shooting a picture there for him. Shirley did a film um, in Japan with Richard Vidmark and Neil Brenner, Harold Heck, and he fed them all with, you know, five million Japanese extras, little box lunches. 
And they were all sitting there, eating their box lunches, and over the horizon came a Rolls Royce. Big car, parked, out the chauffeur got, put on a white coat, chef's <laughs> hat, cooked brinner, the full meal, uh, okay, steak, yeah. uh, potatoes, yeah. sour cream, the whole thing. He's all point to point. All there. He sat there <laughs> by no himself idea. at a table. Brilliant. Everybody, as Shirley said, we were eating our box lunches, you know, <laughs> looking at the star. The dig that. Last one who pulled that was Marie Antoinette. Absolutely, <laughs> 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 Absolutely yeah. yeah. That's why the film industry is such a mess. <laughs> Absolutely. Now you take our nice star Go ahead. come in. Bang, 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 bang. Roll. Is it necessary to move the chair? Yeah. Yeah, because I need a chair to roll for the, for the following minute. Bang. Come in to where? And go and go right, right out, out of the shot. Right, right out of the shot. As close, close as, 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 as possible, ladies, as possible. Uh, I was doing a film in America, and John gave me the stage place with a view to doing it at the Royal Court. Unfortunately, it wasn't a success at the court, sort of so so. And then a couple of years ago, he, had the, he did his screenplay, and we tried, I tried, to set the film up, and uh, I couldn't get the money at all. The subject matter is a bit dicey because they're frightened that they wouldn't have a television sale, you know. So I then went to, um, I went to many, many places. There was no way I could do it. So we had to kind of shelve it. And I had already sets and design and quite a bit into it. So <clears throat> the first chance I got was the two-picture deal with the UA, with the um, Act of Diamonds. I made the first picture, this one. Number one. Give me, uh, let's take a print on that, Angela, dear. Certainly with this subject, with uh, uh, flash forwards and flashes back, and it really has repetitious uh, aspects that uh, have to be filmed in different techniques and interspersed in it like a mosaic. And uh, without having a complete uh, overall run at the whole thing, see it all, he couldn't, uh, he wouldn't know how to put it together. It's all promises with you lovely bloody promises. I'll make you happy, you said. You bloody didn't. I'm here to tell you, Miss Bride of 1956, you didn't make me happy. <laughs> never have, never once. If only you'd enjoyed it. Looked up at me, wanted me. <laughs> Him. <laughs> Him. Is it him you want? Some sort of bloody pervert? Would he make you happy? Would you say, yes, yes, please to him? <laughs> very, very difficult. Much, much harder than anybody ever understands as, a, as an actor. Well, uh, you know, you get through that stage, like Trevor and I stumbling through it. <gasps> Vivian and I, this one. And Barry and I have got a 30-page scene sequence to do. Well, if you came in cold that morning, you know, you suddenly say, oh, my God, that's funny. His left ear's high on his right ear. You know, all, everything you notice, uh, which you're going to get out the way, out the way, and get to what the piece is about. I want to speak to your superior officer. You hear what I say? The chief inspector's at the hospital. I'll speak to the inspector. You stay where you are. Now, don't come near me. You think you're getting away with this, Baxter? Now, no, please, don't hit me. You think you're so bloody clever. And really good acting, or probably good work in general, is really self-revelation, in a way. Uh, that's why we've had a little difficulty today, because uh, we're in very meaty stuff, heavy stuff. Uh, stuff that's not easy to let out. And, uh, first of all, out of the intricacy of a character, because, uh, to me, nobody is simple. And certainly in this script, the complexity is enormous. So finding that complexity, finding the layers of onion to unpeel, uh, 
the rehearsal time is uh, priceless for that. Uh, when is it defensive? When are you hiding? When are you revealing the truth? All of those things, all of those variables, uh, they're critical. And uh, the interesting thing I find is that rather than it um, destroying spontaneity, when you get to shooting, it helps it because uh, the actors are so secure in terms of where they are in terms of the character. You don't know for certain he did it. He did it. You don't know. I know. I'm not going to argue with you. No. You can't know. Who I talked to him. You were there. You saw Baxter there with There was girl. blood on his clothes. Even so, unless you saw him. His hands were covered saw him. in blood. Watched him assault the girl. <laughs> Criminally assault. Yes, all right. Since we use the word. I'll let you drop, get lad. A, get a hold of yourself, yourself lad. lad. I'll, let you I'll let you go or flatten your back. Be a bit of a change that. You flatten your back, eh? Door <laughs> open. Kick out. The actual interrogation between Sean and Ian Bannon really takes place in his head as a memory with which he has to live for the rest of his life. And what it's been possible to do in the, in the film is to have that effect, plus a direct narrative in that we tell the story um, from the, day, uh, the moment that the little girl is picked up outside the school through to the moment when Johnson recognizes why he did what he did. Let go of me. You and me. You. You. I know you. And I'll have you. I'll kill you. Yes, I know. Something. We have to do something. You filthy little problem. It takes one to know one. What are you going to do with that? I don't know. It seems like a good idea hanging on to it. Don't want to make it easy. Wouldn't take that, would you? Right. One way or the other. Or oh, the other, anything. Oh, you bloody man. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Young lad can get hurt playing silly games like that. What would you do then? It means a lot to you. Talk about nothing else. Huh? Back, pull back. Back, over the desk. Confucius says... No more bloody jokes. Lie back and enjoy it. Listen to me. And that's the cut. Okay. Take the taste out. Wrong set. Okay, boys. Take the taste out. Stay more there, boys. Ten years. Tom, pack up your boogie. Same shot again. No, my sweet. It's tight here. Sean, pick him up. There's not going to be any jazzing it about in the cutting room. Young lad can get hurt playing silly games like that. Of you, what would you do then? Yeah? It means a lot to you if you talk about nothing else. Mm -hmm. ah! <laughs> ah, like Confucius says... No more bloody jokes. Lie back and enjoy it. <laughs> Listen to me. You don't even know. One last time. What a mess you must be. Ah! Where were you this afternoon? The pictures! I went to the bloody pictures! For God's sake, make up your mind like a bloody yo-yo up and down! Tell me, Baxter! Nothing I have done can be one half as bad as the thoughts in your head. I wouldn't have your thoughts. So the result of that is that the first picture has worked at the first stage. The next stage is uh, to be proven right at the um, critical and uh, financial return level. Well, I think the film industry has contracted to a great degree now. Um, it's terribly unfortunate of the 60% unemployment over the three years, but I think out of all bad things comes good things. I think possibly the film industry has got rid of a lot of 
what one was, might almost call charlatans, and I think we now have a lot of real pro people. There is a market for this type of picture shot in 28 days, costing what it costs. And I think this is the way it has to be in the future. I think the bad old days of people just spending money because it was there was bad for the film industry, caused the trouble, caused the unemployment. Um, I think that one of the uh, advantages of a setup such as Sean's been talking about is the, the sort of sense of uh, creative team spirit that can be creative, that, that can be made to, to get the project together. You can get first-rate talents involved uh, at uh, sort of very moderate sums because they all want to do something well and I think they feel that nobody's going to actually uh, exploit them. Because every dollar has been spent on the film. So nobody's been shortchanged, and the whole, uh, including the public, and it's there, you know, for people to see. Obviously, um, like uh, Richard was saying, and uh, Dennis there, about, uh, I've no doubt that you'll get uh, anybody, any actor, if they really feel that they're getting a fair uh, crack at the whip and a fair share of what's going, um, they'll, um, They won't hesitate to come along. I think that everybody has been properly and fairly rewarded, and uh, uh, the uh, the comparison between fees involved is very healthy. I think everybody was very happy about it. And, you know, I mean, the thing that has been achieved on it, which is very uncommon in a film, is that everything about it is first choice. Usually in a picture, you come down to second or third or fourth choice. But we had a very good screenplay. We got the director everybody wanted, the first choice. We got the actors for every part that everybody wanted. Nobody dropped out. They got the composer they wanted. It's very unusual to go right through to the end, and it's exactly what they all wanted. And I think that that proves that the setup of the organization is right. And if there's any money coming, they all get some of it too. The first project was a, a difficult subject anyway because of the, uh, the problems we had getting it off the ground initially. Now everybody thinks it's um, the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> It was unique. I can't imagine it being done. Can't imagine it being done by anyone but Brando. But then that's because I thought he was exceptionally good in it. There's no interest in anything that happened in the film for me. I mean, I don't care about those people. I don't care about what they do. Two views of Bernardo Bertolucci's sensational new film, Last Tango in Paris. We shall be returning to it later when we have comments from a variety of people, including Jane Birkin, Serge Ginsburg, and Zuzu, the star of Eric Romer's Love in the Afternoon, which I shall also be looking. Also later, the new Satyajit Ray film, The Adversary, and Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall, which is based on Spike Milligan's novel. First, however, Savages, the new film directed by James Ivory, who made his name with Shakespeare Waller. Savages is based on an idea not a thousand times removed from that of the great Bunuel's exterminating angel. It starts with a group of primitive tribesmen about to sacrifice a dark stranger they have captured to their even darker gods. They're interrupted by the arrival of a croaky boy.
Never having seen a perfect sphere before, they treat it as the harbinger of a new god, and off they go in search of its meaning. They come upon a magnificent deserted country house and proceed to fall under its civilizing influence. In the twinkling of a sophisticated eye, they don the panoply of Western society and turn into a high bourgeois house party dressed in the wardrobe of the 30s and exchanging cruel aphorisms in the timeless style of Jean Anouy. One becomes a wicked capitalist, busy exploiting a distant African colony, and others metamorphose into a sensitive Gershwin-type songwriter, a wicked lesbian, and a victimized black servant, who was, I need scarcely say, the one about to be sacrificed in the jungle before the advent of the croquet ball. It all looks rather like the kind of naughtily ambiguous dream that imaginative people have after more whiskey and less sex than they'd like. Certainly the film has style, however. Its writers come from the stable of the New Yorker magazine, and they've given it the most typical of New Yorker virtues, elegance. The film is saved by the excellence of the performances, largely by young off-Broadway stage actors, by Walter Lasley's photography, and by the inventive surrealism which makes one wonder what will happen next, even while one doesn't much care. The cleverness here is the cleverness of an interior decorator who has something madly important to say but wouldn't for the world like to upset anybody. Now here's a scene where we see all the characters at a smart dinner party, New Yorker style. I want you to know Julian Branch well. He's an extraordinary talent. One hears that our young musical genius is now writing a book and that it is dedicated to... No, the dedication's neither here nor there. My greatest reward is in seeing his work grow day by day. Let you read everything. Everything. I've heard, Mr. Branch, that you frequent our music halls. Strange, I think, for a serious composer to frequent a music hall. It's not strange at all. The maestro Analetti knew the art of juggling. And von Hindendorf danced the mazurka with gypsies. There is much to be learned at the music hall. I don't think you will learn anything at a music hall. Look, wouldn't you like to be able to do this? Do you like that girl? Well, Cecily is attractive, don't you think? I find her excessive. What a strange word to use for such a modest girl. I find her modesty excessive. And I will find your liaison with murder excessively boring. It's not understood here is how very fragile his hold will prove to be. I assure you, he is bluffing. Fortunes will be lost. Yes. And other fortunes will be made. That's the man. Who's the man? Him. One to wish one in polite to point. The fat one. Oh, you mean murder? I don't know his name. Margaret Davenport pointed him out to me the other day at the opera. They say he killed a man in Africa. <laughs> Well, at the end of the month at the Everyman Hampstead, there's to be a retrospective season of James Ivory's films, including Shakespeare Waller, a gentle, affectionate study of a group of English actors trying to give the Indians Shaw and Shakespeare. In this scene, a different kind of dinner party from the one in Savages, the actors are entertained by an Indian prince. When I was, when I was in London for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, well, of course, that was theatre. Magical. Magical in every way. Though, if you'll permit me to say it, the ceremony at Westminster Abbey was a trifle on the lengthy side. <laughs> at least it seemed so to me then. Because, you know, I happen to be standing behind a pillar all the time. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, when I was in London, I, I would slip away whenever I could uh, from the round of banquets and whatnot uh, to spend an enjoyable and instructive evening in the theatre. You don't find it too hot, I hope? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, strangely enough, my great love of Shakespeare was first aroused by one Miss Hamming. And, and, and Miss Hamlin. Do you know her? No. Actually, no. A pity. She was an accomplished actress. I saw her in Simla, playing the part of Portia. I'm reminded of her by a very charming daughter. <laughs> I was 13 or 14 at the time, and I was held spellbound, literally in accordance with Aristotle's precept, purged with pity and terror. The quality of mercy is not strained. <laughs> it droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven on the place beneath. Tis twice blessed to 
Blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis my... Oh, no, no, no. You, 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 you flatter me. A great influence on James Ivory was Satyajit Ray, whose new film, The Adversary, has just opened. The Adversary was actually made before Company Limited, which I reviewed a few weeks ago. Company Limited dealt with the infighting among a group of successful executives. The Adversary is, I suppose, a story of failure, though failure, as so often, wears a more charming face than success. Adritiman Chatterjee plays Siddhartha, a young man looking for work in modern Calcutta. He is intelligent and eager to compromise with life up to a point, but as his brother points out, he thinks too much. And Indian bosses no more want young men who think for themselves than do their English counterparts. Siddhartha is too sensitive to kowtow to self-important authority and too weak, or too wise, to take the path of revolution. He's trapped also between his sensuality and his shyness. He's every young man, in a sense, in a hurry, with nowhere to go. The film develops slowly, but it has the humanity and respect for life which marks all Ray's work and gives him a dignity that needs no loud publicity. Here is the cruelly polite interview that begins Siddhartha's harsh disillusionment. How old are you? I'm just over 25, sir. You are a BSc? Yes. When did you graduate? Um, 1966. And you've been idle ever since? No, sir. I was at the medical college for two years. What were you doing there? Studying, sir. Only for two years? Yes. What made you give up medicine? Did you suddenly lose interest in medicine? No, sir. I lost my father. I see. What's your aim in life? Right now, it's to find a job, sir. But the job you've applied for has nothing to do with medicine. No, sir, but I also did botany for my science degree. Do you like flowers? Not unconditionally. Some I like, some I don't. Does the term mitochondria suggest anything to you? It's a botanical term, sir. Mitochondria are small, thread-like bodies in cytoplasm. Who was the Prime Minister of England at the time of independence? Whose independence, sir? Our independence. Exactly. What would you regard as the most outstanding and significant event of the last decade? The war in Vietnam, sir. And now for a bit more fuss about the film All the Fuss is About, Last Tango in Paris. The story is simple, based on the kind of daring idea for which important directors can always obtain reverential and hopeful finance. A middle-aged man, his soul convulsed in a silent scream after the inexplicable suicide of his loved but unfaithful wife, goes to inspect an empty flat at the top of a Paris block. He there encounters a luscious young girl, also seeking a refuge from the horrors of everyday reality. In her case, a stuffy and fatherless bourgeois home and an opportunistic lovey-dovey fiancé who makes bogus movies. Man and girl prowl round each other until suddenly, bang. Pain, hatred and alienation prove to be violent aphrodisiacs. He takes her like a dose of poison. She is shattered and excited. They agree to meet again, but only in the flat, body to body, nameless as animals, without a past or a future. Eroticism, as André Malraux has said, is the means by which man escapes from his era, and ours, God knows, is an era to escape from. But for how long? In the end, the pact of silence has to be broken. The girl has come, however, unwillingly to love the man's randy despair. And when he refuses to tell her more, she runs away. He pursues her, and in the pursuit, like a bluebeard who has abandoned his castle, he loses his mystery and his fatal charm. He's revealed as a run-down human being, grotesque and, the final humiliation, himself in love. The girl is disenchanted, disgusted, and dismissive. But what Bertolucci has made of this idea has been hailed as a turning point in the cinema. It has also been pantingly denounced by such great moral organs as the News of the World, which places its running story about the film next to one of its own typically artistic pictures, and by the Sunday Mirror, which refers to a common sexual activity not actually in the film at all. And Mr. Alexander Walker, on the other hand, is the film's John the Baptist, preparing us for the coming of the masterpiece and warning us of what our eyes must see and our ears must hear if we are truly to come of age. The fuss is inevitably yet again about sex. For the first time, ladies and gentlemen, before your very eyes, a man and woman actually at it. 
or at least for the first time with meaning and sincerity and tragic significance. But this is art. This is the ultimate truth. Hats off. We are at the cenotaph of the flesh. Well, last week I went to Paris to see the film. So does last tango in Paris really represent something new and important? French critics on the whole think it does, and the Paris public is flocking to the many cinemas where it's showing. While I was in Paris, I talked with some other people who'd seen it. First, to English actress Jane Birkin, who's married to composer Serge Ginsberg. Her record, Je t'aime, was, you may remember, banned by the BBC. You think the film was about Brando, then? Yes, I think that you had to care about the two people in the film, especially him. Otherwise, I don't... I think that... that everything else is justified in the film because you do care about him so very much. I think that excuses anything. I think you can do absolutely anything if you really care about the people. So, f for the scene about the butter and the things that you hear about, um, I think that it's important as a whole, as for the character of Brando in the film. I don't see how you can cut the scene, the love scenes. You, don't th you think that, that, that what is shown had to be shown, do you? Yes, absolutely necessary. I can't... It's like it is. If you cut it out, it's like cutting out the violence out of deliverance, like cutting out... It's, it's the thing that... It's even the thing that at the end makes her frightened and... His death, it's the... Take it out of the film and you're left with a film with two people that perhaps love each other in a, in a partner. I, you take all the, all the spark out of it. You take the, the shock out of it. It's a film with, with things he, he wants to shock, and he shocks. You yourself have, have taken part in, in what, for want of a better term, you call erotic films. Do you think this was an erotic film? Well, it gave you, when you were watching the scenes, it gave you feelings that I presume must be erotic. And I think that perhaps it will shock other people that have before had uh, um, very strict principles on, this, on the sort of thing you see, like um, people being buggers and things like that, that I think they're amazed to find that there, that there is an attraction there in that way that I think it's erotic. Suppose that you had played the Maria Schneider part. Would this be something which you might have done or would have done for Bertolucci but would not have done for somebody else? I would have thought that, that you would have had to have had complete confidence in feeling that he would... that would have done it in that particular way, yes. It's very difficult to tell. I, I, I don't know. I don't know whether he would have liked me to have done it. It's a very difficult thing to, to know. L'important is what results of this collaboration with cinema. The important thing is what results from the collaboration between director cameraman and editor, and the choice of actors and intentions. Bertolucci elected not to use close-ups and so leave things to the audience's imagination. The only way, therefore, that it was possible to avoid obscenity and so remain in medium shot was to film the actors with their clothes on. For me, pornography is simply big close-ups of the sexual parts. Robert Benayoun is the film critic for the weekly magazine Le Point. I would say it's a film about um, a crisis in a man's life. And I think uh, 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 by that point of view, it's not a new film. I think it's a film uh, sh should be compared to what, uh, several things. Uh, several people like uh, Arthur Miller or uh, Norman Mailer have expressed many times. In this sense, do you think there is a strong American influence on the Yes, film? certainly. I think it's, the man could not be anything but, um, but American. I think there's a sense of doom, there's a sense of lost innocence, that we associate mostly with uh, American intellectuals, and that this man should seek in f here in Paris uh, that kind of girl and that kind of, of experience through that girl who, who is a, 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 a bourgeois uh, little girl, 
uh, not specially uh, vicious or mean or, or perverse, I would say, just typical uh, of the girls uh, that you see now. And uh, I think that's typically American. The censorship of this film, is, is the, the censorship problem is interesting because, as I understand it, it has had no trouble here, is that right? It had no trouble here, but I would say that's very important. If the film had been French, it wouldn't have never been shown, and it probably would have never been done, too. I think the film was not censored because it was a big, important, costly film. Uh, uh, with financial, uh, with finan financial, uh, uh, it was American pr pr practically, uh, financially, and it had a very important star, which was Marlon Brando. And costly commercial films from foreign countries with important stars are never censored. The point being, of course, that Last Tango was filmed in Paris. In France, although uncut, it is restricted to adults over 18, and notice has to be displayed, which warns that the film contains scenes which may be offensive. I saw the film with my mother on my right, 50 years old, and my grandmother on my left, 70 years old. And I was very anxious about the reaction uh, would be, and the reaction was very good. And uh, only one point for the grandmother. Um, why Marlon Brando does he used for his sexual feet butter? Um, butter is so expensive. <laughs> That's very nice. Otherwise, they, they weren't upset by the film. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were very, they like very much. And um, no, no disappointment. No. I asked the young French actress Zuzu, star of Love in the Afternoon, for her reactions to the film. First, I don't think the last tango in Paris is erotic at all. I mean, uh -huh. there's no erotic for me in this film, first. Second, I wouldn't do the part. Well, you know, that's just because I couldn't do it. I mean, what Maria Schneider is doing, I couldn't do it, I know it. Because it doesn't, because it doesn't interest you? Because it... Well, first, uh, well, I like... Uh, certain film of Bernardo Bertolucci, I don't like this one, uh -huh. okay? And uh, this part does not interest me. The whole film does not interest me. So I know I couldn't do it. Why know? is yeah. it that this film uh, becomes, as is evident from us, a, a talking point? Why, why, what well, is I mean, so... I think uh, people are very, very snob. And... Uh, it's a free size, is it? First, Bertolucci's got a reputation now. And uh, Brando is doing things that, you know, uh, excites pe some people, you know. I'm so pleased to see Brando doing these sort of things. And, it's, you know, I think it's a very snobbish reaction. I mean, I don't see what... I mean, if you listen carefully to the dialogues, I mean, you know, they're so stupid. Are there things that should not be shown, no matter who does them or under whose direction? you can show everything on a screen if it's well done, I mean but it has to be really controlled and well done. Well, I mean, I'm ready to see anything on the screen. Yes. I mean, everything is interesting, but the way to show it is, the, I mean, you have to find the right way to show the things, or else, you know, there's no interest. In fact, no one who's seen a blue movie will find Last Tango in Paris all that remarkable in terms of what is actually shown, though they may wonder why Brando always keeps his trousers on unless it is as tribute to the strength of his tailor's seams. In my honest view, the actually nameless, characterless bodies in blue movies who perform acts of totally unconcealed sexual agility create in some ways more genuinely pitiful images than the tastefully tasteless posturing of Brando and Schneider. Gossip has it that the story was originally intended for Jean-Louis Trintignant, who was so memorably null in Bertolucci's The Conformist. Then along came Brando. One can imagine the world-weary genius of the legendary Hollywood star, sparking on the directorial freshness of young Bernardo. From their creative romance, it seems to me, sprang last tango in Paris as we now see it. Brando endows the story with all of the tenderness of a bayonet charge. He rants his contempt for women, for love and for life. Not as a character within a dramatic concept, but as a great star, punching holes in the form, cutting slice after bloody slice from the raw meat of a life sacrificed to vanity and fame. Brando uses endless foul language. 
not to create a sort of poetry as Samuel Beckett does, nor a sort of morality as Jean Genet is said to, nor dramatic excitement as Tennessee Williams can, nor even a sort of agonized farce as Lenny Bruce could. No, he, he simply assaults us with the tired and dirty cliches behind show business's commercial smile. He talks like famous bullies talk to waiters who have forgotten the ice. Last Tango in Paris is not pornography, at least not if pornography is supposed to be exciting. It is indeed a powerful incentive to detumescence, a practical demonstration that one may be bored and still not stiff. Well, is this a film which, as its advocates so noisily claim, must be shown? Certainly, I think Last Tango in Paris should be freely available for English audiences, as should blue films, religious films, war films, and the uncensored Lord Longford, though perhaps uh, not to those too old to understand them. But to suggest that Last Tango in Paris is in some sense important in a deep way is merely one more example of the greedy chat of that well-known old tart, Madame Showbiz. Well, now for a much more traditional, but to me an infinitely more compassionate and affecting, effective movie uh, that's recently opened in London. Eric Romer's L'Amour l'après-midi, Love in the Afternoon. It's the last of Romer's six contes moraux, not so much moral tales as tales about morals. This time the dilemma is that of Frédéric, a young husband with all the symptoms of seven-year itch, one of those countless handsome, happy and regretful men who always begin by telling other women how much they love their wives. Frédéric might live forever in his playboy fantasies, were it not for the arrival in his good bourgeois life of an ex-girlfriend who approaches him with all the hesitation of a thirsty lioness at a water hole. The girl, played by Zuzu, is one of those delicious temptations from which any good bourgeois begs the good lord to defend him. But while we were in Paris, I also asked Zuzu about the film. Uh, working with Romer is just fine. I mean, he's a nice man. He's taking care a lot about every actor and uh, he's giving you not so much, uh, I mean, doesn't give you a lot of orders or things to do, but he lets you do a lot. Does he give you the way, uh... A complete scenario, I mean... Do yeah, you... everything is written down, uh, dialogues, everything. Gives you dialogues just a day before. He writes it each day? Yeah. Or he probably wrote it before, but he just give it, give it to you a day before. So you don't know what's going to happen? No, you know the whole story, yeah, right. you know everything You've about... You've had a scenario, but not the dialogue? Yeah. So are you then planning out the scene each day? You don't rehearse in advance? Then? No. No, and... Uh, we don't re really rehearse even, you know. We do a mechanic rehearsal, uh -huh. and uh, we do one or two or three takes, and that's what he wants. <laughs> I mean, if you're good. And she is, very. But good within the context of a film rich uh, with observation and full of the comedy which comes from accurate imagination. Romer resists the temptation to inflate his stories with the kind of exaggerations which seduce actors and backers. Nothing epoch-making, nothing scandalous, nothing violent happens. Instead, there's a distillation of experience into humor, wit, and pathos. A lovely, as well as a puncturingly well-observed piece of work, a slice of life a la grande cuisine. Well, I like the scene where I'm telling him that I love him. Because it was a lot of fun to do it. Because I didn't love him at all. <laughs> and I couldn't even believe that the girl in the film would love him. So I was trying to think what she was thinking, you know. And I had to say, and I said to Romer, could I say just, I love him? He said, no, 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 you have to say, je, uh, je suis amoureuse de toi, je t'aime d'amour, je t'aime. I said, God, I, well, you know, why? He said, that's very important. I said, OK, let's do it. We're not going to rehearse or anything. I want to do it straight. And he said, OK. <laughs> and I did it. And it was fun to do it. Écoute, Chloé. No, I don't écoute pas. I know très bien ce que tu vas me dire. Tu vas encore me parler de ta femme. No, précisément, ce n'est pas à ma femme que je pense. Mais à toi et à moi, il y a notre amitié qui est en train de se gâcher. Je ne crois pas à l'amitié. Il n'y a d'amitié ni de ta part ni de la mienne. Tu sais, depuis quelque temps, je suis en train de m'apercevoir d'une chose. Je t'aime. Je t'aime d'amour. 
Je suis amoureuse de toi. J'espère que non. Si tu étais amoureuse, je te fuirais. Tu voudrais m'avoir à toi toute seule, que je quitte ma femme. Pas forcément. Je suis heureuse comme ça. Il me suffit de savoir que je t'aime et de te le dire. Tu sais, j'ai beaucoup d'imagination. Je peux même m'imaginer que je fais l'amour avec toi quand je le fais avec d'autres. Tu es folle. Non. Ce qui est fou, c'est de prétendre aimer quelqu'un avec qui on vit. Moi, je ne pourrais pas aimer un type qui serait installé dans mon lit et s'imaginerait avoir le droit d'y rester. Surtout si c'était le père de mon enfant. Tu sais que j'ai envie d'avoir un enfant. Oui, tu me l'as déjà dit. Eh bien, sache que j'ai trouvé le père. Ah. Oui, toi. Now, to close, the film based on the uh, irreplaceable Spike Milligan's novel, Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. Spike Milligan plays his own father in a couple of brief appearances, and Jim Dale, the young Spike, called up in 1939. Next week, Joan Bakewell will review the films, so from me, good night. Now here's Jim Dale facing the rigors of basic training. Don't worry. It's just good, clean fun. Right. Now, I know all you lads fancy yourselves as wee Tarzans. So we've devised this little exercise to pander to you. I want each of you to get on yon platform, grab the rope, swing across, and send the rope back. You understand? I hope so, lads. Because the yon innocent-looking bushes are really vicious stinging nettles and bum-piercing thistles. To keep you aloft. You understand now? Right then! You Milligan, Neil, you're fast after me! Right. I'll go first. Send the rope back for each of you. You can. Lying on the floor the other day in the studio in Ginny's Tower with Charlotte Rampling sitting on top of me, and my flower buttons open. <laughs> and all the crew were, I'm going, oh, what on earth am I doing? I'm 53. Why am I going through this at 53? When I was England's number one, you know, no, pretty face. <laughs> it's madness. Get moving. Drop it, I say. I'll drop you. Get back! This thing works! Get back! Get back, I say! Get back! It's 23 years since Dirk Bogard became a star as the homicidal wide boy, the murderer of dear old Dixon of Doc Green in The Blue Lamp. He'd been a stage actor first, and a pretty good one, too. But in 1947, he signed a contract with Rank and embarked on a career as a hero. Occasionally, of course, he played the heavy, but generally speaking, he came to epitomise throughout the 1950s the ideal, clean-cut young Englishman, every girl's dream of the desirable young fellow next door. Bogard played pretty well every kind of hero, from Sidney Carton to Dr Simon Sparrow in Doctor in the House. May, may I call him after you, Doctor? I would like to. Yes, Mrs. Connor. Yes, certainly, if, if you'd like to. My name's Simon. Simon? Oh, that is a nice name. Oh, I'll call him Simon, and then he'll be reminded of you as long as he lives. Thank you, Mrs. Cooper. It's a great honour. Must be wonderful to be a doctor. Yes. Yes, it must. 
In those last years of the star system and the studio system, Bogard was Britain's biggest star, the idol of the teenagers, top of the box office polls, and his reputation in this country, at least, was so firmly established that he even survived a potentially disastrous period in Hollywood when he played Liszt in a rather dreadful film called Song Without End. I suppose what saved him and enabled him to outlive what he calls the popcorn pictures was the fact that no matter what the films were like, Bogard's own performances could rarely be faulted. But it was in the 1960s, with films like Victim and King and Country, that he really began to convince others that he was a serious actor. The culmination of all this came when he was cast by Visconti, first in The Damned and then in Death in Venice. Since that film, which many regard as the apogee of his career, Bogart has rather surprisingly gone into virtual retirement, or anyway, a state of suspended animation. Only twice since Death in Venice has he emerged with varying degrees of reluctance to appear in other films. He lives now in a converted farmhouse near Grasse in the south of France, and it was there this summer that he talked to me about his disenchantment with film acting and the processes that took him from the budding young star of The Blue Lamp to the middle-aged philosopher with his flies undone, wondering what on earth it was all about. Why did you leave England, Dirk? Because you're not a tax dodger, are you? No, I wouldn't be living in France if I was a tax dodger. No, no. Oh, dear. Uh, there was nothing for me to do in England. Because I got rather of the sick of sitting outside Tunbridge Wells in the wet. Uh, there wasn't any work to do. After, after the failure of... Jack's big film with me, we both thought it was our sort of moment of great thing, our mother's house. We thought we'd both really done something extraordinary with that. That was a work of such love and <laughs> with all those kids and an empty house in Croydon. But it was a complete and utter disaster. There were failures, the things were wrong, and there was just sort of nothing came. I mean, bits and pieces came. Will you do a telly series? Will you do a guest appearance in this or that? You know? And there was The Fixer, which I went and played a stupid part, a stupid film. Uh, there wasn't much. Then there was Justine. That was another guy. And I suddenly found I was doing guest appearances and becoming, with great respect to him, you know, like one of the unknighted knights. Um, which I didn't really think was right. <laughs> so I thought I'd come over here because I'd been asked to come here and be a star again. Yes, of course, the, your early part of your career was you were making films for popcorn eaters, in effect, weren't yes, you? Yes, of course I was. Until, <clears throat> until Victim. Until about Victim. Well, until Doctor's Dilemma, which was before Victim. Yes. And that was with Anthony Asquith yes. and George Bernard Shaw. Not a bad writer. Not a bad writer. And suddenly one realised that there was a possibility in the cinema. You, know, you didn't just have to do, oh dear, fortune cookie scripts. You know what I mean by that? Yes, I do. <laughs> and that was when your career took off in a, an entirely different direction. I got restless when I found that you were able to work with somebody like us within a Shaw script. And then, I, then the victim thing came up and I thought, well, now there's a point a statement that you can make in the cinema and you might as well use the cinema for, uh, to make a statement as opposed to just flopping around with the you know left profile for every shot and your perm hair permed and your teeth capped and oh it was self-disgust i think i was too old you see really. i didn't start at 18 i started at 27. yes you've always looked very young of course well fortunately that's been the family <laughs> <laughs> but then you were what to about 40 playing 30 year olds and that was I, was, a... I was about 40 41 i was always playing you know, 30 30. And they say well you can get away with 25 which made me even feel more disgusted you know and then all these little kids writing letters saying we love you we love you to marry you and so i was sort of a pop singer well anyway all that was beginning to change and i decided the wind of change was coming with this pop thing and when bill haley started yeah. coming i realized that the film stars were going to go out yeah. so at least i was absolutely right on that score
Yes, indeed you were. And I teared off into the right kind of movies before the bottom fell out of the popular cinema. Because all the fan adoration that I'd had for years and years and years for little girls and teeny boppers, you call them, and things like that. Mm. And the people like Maggie Lockwood and Sir Granger had before me, they disappeared. They went into a sort of mist after four little boys from Liverpool called the Beatles. But by that time... By that time I cleared. Yes, because you'd made Victim by then. Yeah, I'd, you? I'd made all the no sequence, yeah. And Victim, of course, was a, was a considerable breakthrough as a film. It was a big bre breakthrough as a film. It was a very brave film. It's something that Basil Dearden's never been respected or rewarded sufficiently for. Uh, when Basil died and he got that obituary, I was so ashamed that they didn't bother saying it. He actually altered the course of English cinema as much as Losey did. Because of the first, it was the first film actually to take homosexuality as a serious subject, wasn't it? Yes, it was the first film to, to take it seriously as a subject and present it as a serious subject, uh, to present it as a problem that was solvable and that everybody had. You know, it wasn't sort of like having uh, some dreadful unknown disease. Lots of people had it. It was a reasonable thing to have. You can't hope to keep this out of the press. It's not as though you can go into court as Mr. X. You're, you're too well known. I don't want to. I believe that if I go into court as myself, I can draw attention to the fault in the existing law. Knowing it will destroy you utterly. Yes. We're going to need each other very much, aren't we? No, no. I'm going to go through this alone. I don't want you here when it happens. I started this thing. I've hurt you terribly, I know that. But I can just get through it to the end if you're not here to face the final humiliations. They're going to call me filthy names. My friends are going to lower their eyes and my enemies say they always guessed. I don't want you a part of that Roman holiday. But it was particularly bold for you, I would have thought, because you had had this sort of following of, of little girls and then to appear in a film as a homosexual... You're, they, didn't you're really mind, they didn't mind me being homosexual at all because, you know, most people think that being queer uh, means that you've got flu. <laughs> um, they didn't know anything about that at all. I didn't bother them. What did bother them very much was, anyway, it was all beginning to break away, that mm -hmm. pop thing. As I said, because the boys are coming, the kids were coming in, a new form of, of adoration was coming in through the pop singers and through rock and roll and through music. Um, but what they, they, they did get upset because I had grey temples. I was playing really? a 45-year-old man <laughs> <laughs> when I was only 40. And that really bugged them frightfully. So I thought, well, now here it comes. I've got the lines here and all the wrinkles coming in here and the makeup going on, the white temples stuck in. Mm, they got a bit leery because I was too old. And when they wrote and said, you're older than my dad, I knew that I was out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew I had to change. I changed the servant. Then I got a much bigger following playing people like the servant. Still sitting there. What's this? It's wax, so we'll soon wane. Five letters. I haven't got time for all that. Well, you ask me soon enough when you want some help. Look at all this muck and slime. It makes you—it makes you feel sick. Well, do something about it. You're supposed to be the bloody servant. You expect me to cope with all this muck and filth everywhere? All your leavings all over the place without a maid, do you? I need a maid to give me help, and I'm not used to working in such squalor. And what I've got on my hands, you can't expect to get any work done in this place at all. As soon as I get the Uber going, you're straight up it. You're in everybody's way. Oh, why don't you leave me alone? It's this, it's waxed, so we'll wane soon. Five letters. But why don't you get yourself a job instead of moving about the house all the time? Oh, I can't. Here yeah, I am, scraping and skimping, trying to make ends meet, and worse and worse. And you're no bloody help either. Do you know that butter's gone up top as a pound? As a matter of fact, I'll be meeting a man very shortly. <laughs> what man? The man from Brazil? What's he going to do for you? Come down by helicopter on the roof, is that it? Oh, uh, why don't you shut up? Now, the thought that had occurred to me was that your career had had two distinct phases in the way that most film actors' careers don't, that you were the, the as it were, the yeah. pop idol, yes. and then you became a serious actor. Yes. And, uh, no, you're wrong, actually, really, if I can correct you. I've always been a serious actor. Oh, I, I, I became a pop film star. You became a pop film star. I broke that right. image, got rid of the popularity because I disliked it so intensely and went simply went back to being what I'd been before. 
which is a very good stage actor, but working now for a different medium, for the cinema rather than for working yes. in the theatre. Yes. I worked in the theatre for a long, long time, right up to oh, uh, 59, I think 60 was the last time I did play. Well, you were still under contract to rank. Oh, yes, they were, very, they were always very honourable and very honest, and that was part of my, my first contract in 1946 was that I would have six months every year off to do a play, which mm. they allowed, but I didn't realise that every six months I took off, they added on, so in the end I had a 17-year contract. However, it worked out wonderful well because it was a great training ground. But that, and you were, in fact, the longest-running? Yes, I was the longest-running contract, contract artist, except for Dan Floor Robson, who I think was longer than I. And then what? Because without the regular bread coming in, was <coughs> Without the tougher? regular bread, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be. It was, and, you know, Joe and I didn't get paid anything for our movies. Um, I did... I, the servant, I, I took a percentage of the servant, which was fortunate, because that kept me going for a bit, because it made a lot of money in there. But they were all uh, very small budget little <laughs> pictures, and it was very it was dicey. Then I said it built up. But there was a lot of prestige connected with those oh, films, yes. wasn't there? Mm, there was. and, and they, in fact, as you said... And said, then things like Darling came along. Oh, ah, yes. And you see, when I, when I made that switch, I decided I'd only work with new people, with young people, like Slesson. Yeah. You see, if you stick with your contemporaries, mate, you're dead. You're a whore, baby, that's all. Just a whore. And I don't take whores in taxis. A pound what? A pound's not enough. What do you mean? A pound's not enough. Now, wait a minute, don't... Don't you give me wait a minute. A pound's not enough. Now, don't be a pound. Don't you lie on me. It was kicky before and it's kicky now and a pound's not enough. Mate's a lot of promises. Typical for when he's at his way. You're not worth more than a bloody quid anyway. I'm an honest working girl. Five bob in the wall with throws. That's about your bloody mark. You crumb. You Help yourself. Oh, quel largesse. I'm impressed. You bitch, you filthy little bitch. Enjoy yourself. You've got no right to call me anything. I have every right to call you everything. Oh, have you? We're not married. At least not to each other. I never believe that anybody as trivial and shallow as you could have caused as much pain as you did. Oh, blameless gold. Well, if you really want to know, I've stuck it out just about as long as I can. Yes, and just about as often as you can. Dirk, you've worked with a remarkable number of extremely good directors, haven't you? From Fortunately, yeah. What are they... Which ones have you enjoyed most working with? That would be an invidious thing to say. I couldn't, I wouldn't like to say that. But uh, the ones that taught me most were people like George Cukor, who taught me practically everything I know about the cinema, in spite of what I'd learned before from other. But he is an absolute walking encyclopedia of the cinema. I had the fortune to make two very bad films with him. Bad not because of him, uh, but simply they were just dreadful films. One was List, a song without end, or a song to forget, or whatever it was. And um, the other one was Justine, which was the bastardization of Lawrence Darrell's major work. George fought his best on those, and, but the learning that I was able to do, left and right of the badness of the film, was incre absolutely incredible. Then, of course, lo there was Lois Milestone, that one kind of sort of inclined to forget, who taught me how to be cool on the cinema. I'd never been cool before. He taught me that. Which film was that? That was a film called... I think they still call it now, How Dare They, but we called it They Who Dare. <laughs> it was a, another disaster, <laughs> cut to pieces by the producer. Uh, M M Milestone is on record. Uh, he thought it was the next best film that he'd ever made, To a Walk in the Sun. We all here? Right. I'll put you all in the picture. Set your curiosity at rest. Quite simply, the idea is that the ten of us should make a landing on one of the Dodecanese islands. I'll tell you which one in a minute. There are two airfields on the island. Our job is to blow them both up. Simultaneously. This is the island, Rhodes. The Greeks call it Rothos, which means the island of roses. At first glance, this would seem an impossible job, but with any luck to coin a phrase, we, we could have roses all the way. Good luck. That was a waste of good wine. Then there's, of course, there's Lacey now. Mm. 
That goes without saying, ça va sans dire. Uh, and Visconti, of course, without any question at all, who I think really is the emperor of directors. Well, why? I mean, well, how, why is he so special? He's the only... Well, you know, so often one talks of an auteur. We all talk about auteurs. And every director thinks he is one, but they're not. Visconti is an auteur down to the last button, to the last hem on a woman's dress or anything. And to the essence of knowing about a person's feelings as a character, with set, with music, with absolutely everything, and with the cinema, most particularly. It's incredible knowledge of the cinema. What specifically, then, do, do, did you learn from, from Visconti, you personally as an actor? My capabilities. And how far what you I could, could do, yes. And, that I, and I realised that, they, especially with, with Morton Venise, that there was no end to them. That if I wanted to with a man like that, I could do anything. And we have given the physical limitations, of mm. course. I couldn't, you know, couldn't be a bareback rider or a trapeze artist. That's a or fantastic. Or play Mae West. But yeah. the capabilities within my own self were infinite. That's a marvellous thing to learn about yourself, mm. isn't it? It's a very exciting thing to learn. Didn't um, Death in Venice come your way to some extent as a recompense for the way the damned was treated outside Europe? Not really. It, it came... It, he did say when he heard about the mutualisation of the film, and one day we'll make that OK, but already he'd been working out something in his mind from a shot that I did in the dam, and it clicked in that I would be the person to play von Aschenbach. And he telephoned me about a year and a half afterwards and said, would you like to be von Aschenbach? I said, yes, when? He said, well, maybe two, three years' time. I said, well, I'm too young, so I'll wait for two or three years, you know, and then I'll do it. But it happened much quicker than we thought, and that, no, that's another story altogether. But that's why I got one action back. <laughs> but that was a, a daring move on his part, wasn't it? To... It was an incredible move on his part, but, but not uh, incredible to me, but not incredible to him, because he saw the possibility. He saw w what I would do. He never told me, he never spoke to me about the film, ever. I had, I think, a quarter of an hour with him, and I said, no, you, you know, how old do you want me to be? He said, read, man, read the book. And I read the book and I was blue in the face, and I just did... I, I, I never had a discussion. He never told me anything to do at all. I invented the walk, I invented everything. Tremendous confidence he showed in you then to let you go away and, and do it all by yourself, as it were. Yes, well, he was right, wasn't he? I think because yeah. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm he was a man. Right. Of, no, I don't mean that I'm better than anybody. I mean, I was, I was trained and I'm honourable and I work bloody hard. If he saw that I could, if I had the potential and could do it, he, he never makes a snap decision without being absolutely sure. Yeah. Then his confidence in me, I, I was then, you know, sailing. Once he said, You're okay for the punishment, make, I want you. I had nothing else to do except, you know, like instant cake mix. Mm. Follow the rules. <laughs> and the rules are informed by Thomas Mann. How did you feel after you'd made Death in Venice? Did you feel that that was the finest performance you'd given? No, I didn't think that. I, I thought that I would never work again because I didn't want to. That, that I would never have such joy again in work. And I haven't. Uh, so that I might stop, I might as well stop. Because I'd never recapture that extraordinary five months of... Mm. 
of living with a man. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, not living with Visconti, living with me, with Von Aschenbach. Because, um, you know, I don't put on parts like a hat. They sort of have to come up through your body. And you become them, rather. And I realized I'd never have the fulfillment or the happiness in my work again. I, suddenly, it just stopped, and it really did stop. And I drove away from an, an apple orchard up in Bolzano, where we were shooting on occasion. Didn't say goodbye to him or anybody. I got into the car, I had all my hair cut off because it was very long. And the woman cut my hair and I drove here and shut this door and I said, I'll never go back. And I didn't until well, three years afterwards, unfortunately, I was tempted back. <laughs> but in all that, in those three years, you weren't tempted. I mean, obviously, offers came <clears> along. <throat> yes, but they were all the same offers. They were, you know, the old dotty man chasing little boys or little girls oh. or child molesters or queer school teachers or something. Yeah. Son of death in Venice. Right? Son of death in Venice. Uh, they were all dreadful. I know only three of them have been made and they've all been disasters, <laughs> so I was right. Oh, well, you went out of there. <laughs> but then, who, who brought you back? Uh, really, uh, an extraordinary woman called Liliana Cavani, who made a, very, a film, very little seen in, in, in London, called Il Cannabili, or Cannibali. Uh, and also a very clever but, not, but failed film of Galileo. And she's a great television documentarist in Italy, one of the most famous. She's very young. 30, 32. Utterly brilliant, totally brilliant. The visual sense that's incredible. And she wrote this extraordinary, very strange, bizarre story, a very moving love story. Uh, and she tempted me back. I, I had it three years before, but it was too soon after death in Venice. I couldn't, I had to get that out of my system, and it took three years to do it. This was the, the night porter? This is the night porter, yes, which we only finished a week ago, a fortnight ago. But you did, in fact, make a film before that, shortly. I made a little one before I, I, I spit. Called the Serpent, which is a smashing thriller type movie. A great spy movie with Henry Fonda and Neil Brennan. It's great. I've got four minutes, you know, if you bend down to pick up a pin, I'm not there. But it was fun, and I did it to see if I could act anymore, because I thought I'd lost after three years. I got stuck, you know. And it was a great testing ground, too. I was so frightened that I'd, I'd never been so frightened. My mouth would open. But it was a very good. Really? It wasn't bad as that. Oh, it was worse than that. This was, what, the first day on the set? First day on the set in Munich. I nearly, I nearly, I thought, well, this is the end of it, I'm dead. And I, I said, it's no good, I can't do any more film acting, it's too frightening, I'm too old and too rich and too distinguished, I'm not doing any more. <laughs> <laughs> but you had, of course, a very sympathetic producer on that one. I had a smashing producer called Henry Vernoy, he was marvellous. Very, very sympathetic, very understanding. And, and, and aware of one's terror, completely aware of one's terror. And I said, if there's a scene with Henry Fonda, I'll do it. And so I was trapped. There was a scene with Henry Fonda. <laughs> was there supposed to be, or did they write one? No, no, there was, there was, there was. Am I scaring them off? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a British habit. They're being discreet. It's bad form to eavesdrop on MI6, especially if it's a member of one's own club. You mean they know about you? <laughs> no, no. They simply know that Sir Alfred Boyle was my father, Sir Francis my grandfather, and our coat of arms has a cloak and a dagger. Ah. Here we are. Cheers. Cheers. Now then, how's our Mr. Vlasov coming along? He's in great shape, talking his head off. I'm delighted to hear it. You'd better hear what he's been talking about, then tell me how delighted you are. You mean bad news? I'm on my way back from Germany. They hit the jackpot. The French didn't do badly themselves, even though they are on the outside. We should probably thank them for withdrawing their spies from NATO along with the rest. We're handling France government to government. Personal letter from the president. It's touchy. Yes, but... Um, I, w I wouldn't be too hard on the French, you know. We're all very much in the same boat. I, I mean, nobody...